7 and 8 go together. Let's see if I can get these up here. And I'll just put it here. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, they go together with the same experiment. We've got a ring, cylinder, solid sphere, and hollow sphere. We're going, they're, they're all uh, uniform density. Uh, they all have the same mass. Now, it doesn't say anything about their radius. Um, we're going to release them from rest on an inclined surface, and they all roll down without slipping. So there's a, a, some key words here. Um, and there's two questions. I, I'll tell you what, I actually want to jump to number eight first. It's maybe a, a bit easier to argue here. So let's go to number eight here. And which one has the largest total kinetic energy at the bottom? At the bottom. Um, <clears throat> so it's asking about energy. We should probably think about our uh, work and energy strategy. And so I'm, I'm going to start off with my picture. This is how I do my work energy strategy. And regardless of which of these four objects we're talking about, it's circular in nature. It will look something, well, something like that, but circular or spherical. Um, and I'm going to, in my, in my picture here, I'm going to label, this is what I do with my work energy strategy, my initial and final um, position. So we've got those down and next in my work energy strategy I, uh, I choose where is the height equal to zero and whichever point is lower that's what I use and so I'm just going to choose um, this well height zero there. And then the other thing that I need to think about here is uh, with our work energy strategy is to think about the work done by all of the non-conservative forces. So let's take a look at this for just a moment. The work done, this is how I write it, by all the non-conservative forces. Now what forces are acting on these objects as they're rolling down? We've got the force of gravity, we've got the normal force, and there's a key, the key word here, roll without slipping. That means the point that of the uh, object that's in contact with the incline is uh, it's actually instantaneously at rest. If it wasn't at rest, that means it's sliding or slipping. So it is at rest, which means that, uh, that it's actually going to be static friction involved here. Uh, there, there must be friction in order for the objects to roll without slipping. There has to be. Um, we've made the argument before that we need one force that's going to create a torque and make the object rotate. And that is the static friction. So um, gravity, of course, is a, is a conservative force. And so this is going to add up to Um, the, t the work done by all the non-conservative forces is the work done by the normal force plus the work done by static friction. Now, we, we did show this example when we slid an object down on that surface that the normal force does zero work. And uh, I'm, we're just going to have to accept the argument for now that in this case the work done by the normal force is also zero. All right, the normal force uh, yeah, it isn't doing any at work. Uh, static friction. Uh, static friction also, uh, we made just an argument in class and so I guess we'll just have to believe me that when an object rolls without slipping, uh, the static friction also does zero work. So we did not prove that in our 102 class, but uh, that should be the case. And so at this point, we're ready to move on to our, our work energy equation. And so let's just write that up here. What does that look like? <clears throat> Oops. Let's write it here. And uh, let's see, a, a number of these are going to be zero. So let's plug those in. The initial kinetic energy is zero. The work done by the non-conservative forces is zero. Um, and also, uh, so zero kinetic energy because it's released from rest. It's initially not moving, so it has no kinetic energy. We just showed that the no, uh, non-conservative forces do zero work. Uh, and the final potential energy, now we're only considering gravitational potential energy here. And based on our choice of height zero, we can see that that object will have no gravitational potential energy. And I'm going to write this way over here. 
And so there's only two terms that we need to look at here. And let's start off here with the initial gravitational potential energy. Um, it's not given in the problem. All we know is, is that they're released from the same uh, from the same point in the incline. So you know we just we're just going to make up a, a, a variable here to represent the height. And so I'm just going to call that h. All right, they're all all rep all of the objects are released from the same height. And so uh, I can write in here mgh. And actually. Yeah, one thing I didn't, uh, let me make it clear here, that uh, I'm at, we haven't actually started talking about which object is rolling. Because what we're going to do is uh, we're going to say, hey, we're going to work out the same equation for any of them. For any of the four, we can work it out just once and we can see the result. So this equation that we're applying here represents the rolling down for any one of the four objects. All right, the final uh, kinetic energy, actually, oh, this answers our question. We'll, we'll keep this up. Um, we'll keep this equation up here to help us with number when we go back to number seven. But for number eight, we're actually done uh, because which one has the largest total kinetic energy at the bottom? And since this, you know, what we applied here is valid for all of the four, the final kinetic energy is equal to the mass of the object times g times the height. They all have the same mass. They all have the same height. And so this one is uh, answer E here. They all reach the bottom with the same total kinetic energy. <clears throat> all right, so let's go jump back to number seven. And actually, let me just, uh, well, I'm going to erase this here because when the, when the object rolls down to the bottom here, there's actually two components of the kinetic energy that we need to consider. There's both translational and rotational kinetic energy. This object as a whole is moving through space. Right? It's moving through space, that's, so it has translational kinetic energy. It's simultaneously also rotating about its center. Uh, and so there's some rotational kinetic energy. And so we need to consider both of those terms. And so let me, well, yeah, I'll just write it here. The translational kinetic energy, we've seen that formula several times. 1 half mv squared, plus we now we need to add in uh, the rotational kinetic energy, uh, which is has this formula. Now, a couple things here. This, what does this v represent? That's the speed of the center of our circular object, because in general, as an object is uh, rolling down the incline, different points in the object will have different speeds. We're going to consider the center. Uh, which just follows uh, a straight path here. Um, so this is the speed of the center of the object, and this is the rotational inertia then uh, about the center of the object. So that makes things a little easier for us. Now, what we're going to do here, and, and there's a few arguments involved, uh, but if we, if we look on our, say, our formula sheet, if we look these up, um, we'll see that for the ring, the solid cylinder, the solid sphere, the hollow sphere. All of these rotational inertias that we look up about the object center have an m and an r squared. Okay, now r isn't given in the problem, and we don't, it's not even known whether they're the same r or not. So I'm just going to write r for now. All right, we're going to make up r, and then hopefully it'll go away. Um, and so whichever object we're talking about, uh, there's some number here. There's some number that goes right in front. Uh, and so what I'm going to do, this is part of the argument, to, I, I think this actually can simplify the problem, is I'm going to put alpha here. Alpha is a number. All right. For the, for the ring, alpha is 1. For the uniform solid sphere, alpha is one half, uh, etc. So each of these objects has their own number right here. Now, the reason, well, that's going to make things a little bit easier for us because our next step, let's put in our next step here. Now that we can rewrite this,
we're actually getting close because at this point we have to uh, realize that th this is one an example of one of those problems whoops where we have both translational and rotational uh, motion involved and in all of those problems that we look at whether it's rolling without slipping on a surface or if it's a pulley with a string wrapped around it something like that we're going to need one of these three equations that relate the translational motion to the rotational motion. And so in this case, uh, you know, we're talking, we've got something with speed in here, so it seems that this is the one, the equation that's gonna help us uh, relate those two uh, types of motion here. And actually, it's pretty convenient for us because take a look at this here. We've got an r squared times an omega squared, and so that's just equal to v squared. That's v squared right there. And so we're, we can actually, uh, we're getting close here, so I'll just continue over here. m, g, h, and then I've got one half m v squared and a one half alpha times m v squared. So I could, uh, well maybe I'll just write it this way, one half alpha plus one m v squared. Now let's not be, don't, let's not get intimidated here. We, you know, m represents the mass of any of these objects. They all have the same mass. h is the height that we started at. v again is the speed of the center of that object. And alpha is uh, a, a number, uh, a different number for each one of these objects. So our argument is going to work something like this. Let, let's actually start off with the argument by seeing which one of the objects reaches here with the largest speed. Now, we know that they all reach the bottom with the same kinetic energy, but that doesn't mean that they all reach the bottom with the same speed. And we should be able to see that the one that reaches, so everything's the same for the four objects, except for possibly, well, alpha and so uh, speed also. The m is the same, the height is the same. And so we can make the argument here that uh, in order for this equation to be valid, the one that will have the largest speed is the object that rolls that has the uh, smallest value of alpha. And so actually I, at this point, yeah, we'll get out those numbers. Uh, alpha for the ring was one. For the, again, for the uh, cylinder, it's one half. For the hollow sphere, it's two thirds. And for the solid sphere, it's two-fifths. Two-fifths is the smallest of those four values of alpha. And so for the uh, solid sphere, it will have the largest speed at the bottom. We're almost there here. The solid sphere has the largest speed at the bottom. And so uh, what we need to do, what we need to, uh, the argument we need to make now is that, well, if it had the largest speed when it uh, went down when it descended by this uh, height h, well, it would have the largest speed when it was at, say, half the way down, or at any point. The argument that we're, what we're making here is that the solid sphere will have the largest speed the entire time. And they all go the same distance. The solid sphere has the largest speed the whole time, uh, and so it reaches the bottom at uh, er earliest which is the bottom first. So that would be our solid sphere answer C. <clears throat>